Germany in 1945. During the previous five years, Europe had seen the idealistic dream of flight turn into a terrible wartime nightmare. But this was not the end, rather a new beginning. For from this destruction, German aviation has blossomed afresh. Spurred on by the burning desire of its early pioneers, Germany has now taken its place at the forefront of aircraft technology. Today, two massive corporations dominate German aviation. MBB, Germany's largest aircraft conglomerate, and Dornier, the country's last independent aircraft producer. Companies started by two of Europe's great aviation giants, Willy Messerschmitt and Claude Dornier. Of the two men, Claude Dornier's career was the longest, spanning the whole spectrum of aviation development from the airship to space exploration. Born in 1884, Dornier was a most reluctant genius. His first ambition was to be an architect. Dornier's school record was, however, undistinguished. Yet after leaving school, he enrolled at the Munich Technical University, where he gained an excellent engineering degree. It was on a trip to Lake Constance in 1910 that Dornier first saw Count von Zeppelin and his airships. Zeppelin had become a national hero in Germany and despite many setbacks, was pioneering the development of lighter-than-air flight. Dornier, inspired by this charismatic figure, applied for a job. To his surprise, he was summoned to Friedrichshafen. At this time, many airships were being lost through a new and mysterious problem, metal fatigue. Claude Dornier came up with a new type of metal flange that both reduced weight and added strength. It was this breakthrough that enabled much larger Zeppelins to be constructed, so paving the way for both military and civil development. In the following years, the Zeppelin company went from strength to strength, and regular passenger services were started to many European cities. New endurance records of up to 24 hours were set. And from 1910 to 1914, 35,000 passengers were carried on routes spanning thousands of miles. Dornier was soon promoted, and as head of the test department, he solved yet another crucial problem, that of handling an airship in strong ground winds. It was 1913 when Dornier came up with this unique design for rotating an airship hangar as it floated on a reservoir of water. Seeing the potential in his new protégé, Zeppelin gave Dornier his own airship design project. His machine, the Victoria Louise, incorporated many innovations in metal construction. And as the airship was moved out for its test flight, Dornier could only watch. After initial tests, the order was given for takeoff. With the full complement of passengers on board, the Victoria Louise's first test flight also proved a great success. This airship carried out many civilian trips before its final conversion to military use. The German people soon became captivated by these great airships, and many thousands would gather at Friedrichshafen to watch their departures. Amongst them was a young boy whose name was also to become synonymous with German aviation, Willy Messerschmitt. Born in Hamburg in 1898, Messerschmitt had always been fascinated by flight and at the age of 11 was present at the first German air display where the Wright brothers' aircraft were being demonstrated. Inspired by these early pioneers, Messerschmitt soon began to construct his own model gliders, basing his ideas on Germany's earliest pioneer of flight, Otto Lilienthal. Lilienthal is the unsung hero of world aviation. His work provided the first practical evaluation of actual flight and was used extensively by the Wright brothers. Lilienthal 
believed that one can only get a proper insight into the practice of flying by actual flying experiments. In 1892, after many failures, Lilienthal launched himself into the history books with his first flight of 80 meters. After making many successful flights, he earned the reputation as the first man to fly a practical heavier-than-air machine with any consistency. During the next four years, he fabricated numerous models, which were sold all over the world and inspired many early aircraft designers. In 1896, during the flight trials of a new design, he crashed and was killed. His philosophy and work was to have a profound effect on the young Messerschmitt. At the age of 15, he got associated with a man by the name of Hart. And Hart was building gliders in those days. This was the First World War, 1914-15 uh, then. And, uh, Hart had to become a soldier, but he sent postcards to young Willy Messerschmitt on uh, how he should build uh, these gliders, and uh, so he did. So uh, he got a very early and young involvement in uh, aviation through this uh, construction of gliders, and in fact, flying of gliders. Claude Dornier was also turning his attention to fixed-wing aircraft, and in 1914, he began work on a large flying boat. Instead of using wood, cloth, and piano wire, Dornier opted for a lightweight metal construction, and in 1913, the RS-1 was launched on Lake Constance. But it never flew. The night before the test flight, it was wrecked by a violent storm. Undeterred, Dornier constructed the RS-2, which made its first flight in 1916. The aircraft proved successful, and the RS-3 soon followed, containing the innovative tandem engine arrangement that was to feature largely in his later aircraft. During the final stages of World War I, Dornier also built a series of successful fighter aircraft, pioneering the use of lightweight alloy metals and modern production line techniques. But events were soon to overtake Dornier and Messerschmitt. With the armistice of 1918, aircraft production was halted. The subsequent Treaty of Versailles ordered the wholesale destruction of German aviation, and a ban on all future construction was imposed. Willy Messerschmitt escaped serious loss since gliders were exempt from the ban. But Claude Dornier lost everything. His aircraft were broken up, his airships destroyed, his business ruined. The once busy Manzo plant on Lake Constance lay empty and derelict. Despite his seemingly hopeless situation, Dornier was determined to continue working and soon began designing aircraft from his home. In 1920, he produced a small flying boat, the Labella. To avoid the construction ban, he moved to a boatyard in Switzerland, and a year later, the Labella made its symbolic maiden flight over Lake Constance. But Dornier soon finds the Swiss facilities too small, and with a larger project in mind, he buys a derelict shipyard at Marina di Pita in Italy. Dornier throws his last hope into a large twin-engine flying boat. This unique aircraft, designated Val, proves highly successful. So much so that the Spanish government orders six even before flight trials are complete. It ensures Dornier's future. The Vol flying boat's solid construction and powerful engines made it popular with pilots. The first long distance flights were attempted by the Spanish pilot, Ramon Franco, in 1924. But during his first attempt to cross the Atlantic, he was forced to ditch through lack of fuel. After eight days, the Vol was salvaged from the heavy seas, having sustained only slight damage. The crew's survival is a testament to Dornier's unique design. Throughout the 20s, a series of highly publicized expeditions were to earn the Dornier Company international acclaim. The Swedish explorer Amundsen used two Vol aircraft in a daring attempt to reach the North Pole. 
but after nine hours flying, he was forced to make a landing on the pack ice to refuel. One of the flying boats was damaged beyond repair. With only limited food supplies, the crew worked desperately to clear a runway for takeoff. After two weeks, the overloaded Val took off and managed to clear the pack ice. Landing in Spitsbergen several hours later, Amundsen declared that he owed his life to Dornier. A year later, a German pilot, Herr von Grono, made a successful crossing of the Atlantic, landing in New York without incident. In 1925 alone, the Vol set 25 world records, including endurance, speed, altitude and payload. With the growing demand in Europe for passenger transport, Dornier designed the land-based Mercury and Comet types. The latter proved particularly successful, and Air Lloyd, later to become Lufthansa, opened many new international routes using this aircraft. Dornier designs were now being sold all over the world. Dornier himself spent several months in Japan, assisting their embryonic aviation industry. In 1927, with the ban on aircraft construction in Germany lifted, Dornier moved back to Germany, opening up his old factory on Lake Constance. He soon began to develop one of the most remarkable aircraft of his career, the Doe X. After three years of planning and construction, the flying boat was launched on the 12th of June, 1929. With three decks and a wingspan of 157 feet, the Doe X was the heaviest aircraft of its day. Twelve Bristol Jupiter engines paired in six tandems were needed to power the machine, and each one had to be run up and tested before takeoff. After some brief maneuvering, he gave the order for takeoff. The aircraft lifted easily from the water into the air. It was one of the greatest moments of Claude Dornier's life. 318 flights proved the capabilities of the Doe X. On occasions, it carried up to 170 passengers. After a year of these flight trials, the Doe X took off for a world tour. Every kind of luxury was available on board, and Dornier himself was present for several sections of the trip. After crossing the South Atlantic to Brazil, the Doe X flew north and arrived in New York to a rapturous welcome. Thousands of people came out to watch this giant aircraft circle the city. And after a successful landing, Dornier is given a hero's welcome. On his return to Germany, Dornier found himself once again elevated to the status of a national hero. He had proved, despite his many critics, that an aircraft of this size could have an effective range and levels of safety and comfort hitherto undreamt of. The Doe X represented the first steps towards mass passenger transport. It stands as a landmark not just for German, but for world aviation. But by now, flying boats of this size were beyond the finances of Europe's rapidly collapsing economy. Dornier, along with other German aircraft companies, survived only through generous government subsidies. However, Dornier's Vol flying boats were still proving very successful, and Lufthansa began a regular transatlantic mail service to Brazil. Two supply ships, the Bremen and the Westfalian, refueled the aircraft at sea and relaunched them by steam catapult to complete their flights. Despite the severest weather conditions, 400 of these pioneering crossings were made until 1939 without a single delay or accident. As well as upgrading his flying boat series, Dornier began work on a new land-based aircraft, and in 1931, he produced the advanced passenger transport, the Doe K. 
Its success gave Germany a high-performance airliner which could beat the competition from Europe and the USA. Dornier returned to flying boat design in the mid-30s and produced the Doe 19. And after extensive testing, including severe sea trials, the Doe 19 made a non-stop flight from the Azores to New York. The journey was completed in 22 hours and 12 minutes and marks the beginning of European transatlantic passenger service. The Doe 24, which followed, was designed specifically to deal with the severe weather of tropical it proved highly successful in the Far East and remained in service with the Spanish Air Force in an air-sea rescue role until 1969. The Doe 26 was Dornier's last production flying boat, incorporating the very latest aerodynamic technology and was built for transatlantic passenger service. It was also the first Dornier aircraft to carry the Nazi symbol. In the next few years, all Dornier aircraft were committed to military use, and Claude Donnier was to find himself part of a highly effective war machine. Throughout this period of Donnier's success, Messerschmitt still struggled for survival. During the First War, he continued to develop his gliders, and in 1922, he and his close collaborator, Friedrich Hart, started a small flying school. The special demands of glider design, low weight and drag combined with high strength and lift, led Messerschmitt to produce many new features, including the single spar wing, which was to prove so significant in the success of his later powered aircraft. In 1923, Messerschmitt formed his own aircraft company. And after a slight relaxation of the Versailles Treaty, he produced a series of powered gliders, culminating in the successful M17, a small two-seat machine. A year later, with a strong injection of capital, Messerschmitt set up a large company, Messerschmitt Flugzeugbau. To meet the demands of the expanding German airlines, he produced the M18, a single-engine monoplane carrying 10 passengers. Production was soon started, and the M19 and the M20 followed. With the world slump of 1929, demand for aircraft dried up. Unlike Dornier, Messerschmitt found no government subsidy, and in 1931, he went bankrupt. But political events were about to transform Messerschmitt's life. With the rise of Hitler in 1933, covert rearmament began, and huge amounts of cash were injected into the German aviation industry. At first, Messerschmitt undertook various small license contracts and continued to develop his gliders, which proved vital in the secret training of Luftwaffe pilots. But in 1934, a new order is placed, officially for a training aircraft. There can be little doubt, however, of the government's intentions to produce an advanced trainer for the Luftwaffe. For Messerschmitt, it provided a golden opportunity to incorporate a range of new designs, including a leading edge snat, originally a Handley Page patent, and exchanged by Messerschmitt for the single spar wing design. All metal monocoque construction, flush riveting, and a fully retractable undercarriage made the ME 108 the most advanced aircraft of its time. After testing and some modification, the 108 went into full production. Its small 240 horsepower engine could manage 165 miles an hour, an excellent power to weight ratio, and a tribute to Messerschmitt's background in glider design. The 108 became the standard trainer and communication aircraft during the whole of the war period. The design proved so durable that it went back into production in the 1960s and competed very favorably with modern designs. The 
ME-108 was also the forerunner of Germany's most famous fighter airplane. In 1934, the government had given several German aircraft companies the specifications for a fast monoplane fighter. Both Messerschmitt and Heinkel produced designs. Heinkel had unsuccessfully tried to buy out Messerschmitt's struggling company in 1932, and now he poured scorn on Messerschmitt's design. At the fly-off between the two prototypes in 1935, the Heinkel 112 broke the world speed record. Three days later, Messerschmitt's design won it back. Uh, the airplane was uh, revolutionary by its uh, very low weight and uh, high power, again, like the earlier Messerschmitt uh, philosophy, and also a uh, good design for manufacturing not with a uh, very optimum aerodynamic shape, but with a good compromise to also allow mass production. Some 35,000 109s were eventually built in a hundred different variants, more than any other combat aircraft. They formed the backbone of the Luftwaffe's fighter strength throughout the early conflicts of World War II, including the Battle of Britain. Although outclassed by the later years of the war, it remained in service both because of its ease of production and its devastating effects on daylight bomber raids, as this German newsreel shows. The success of the 109 made Messerschmitt Germany's leading aircraft designer. Called upon to make many propaganda films, he became as famous as the fighter ace Adolf Gallant and others who flew the aircraft. Messerschmitt's next project, the ME-110, dated back to 1934 and a specification given to him for a new combat aircraft. Design work on a series of prototypes was begun and on its first test flight, it reached a remarkable speed of 316 miles per hour. Tested in combat during the battle for Poland, it proved a great success. Only when faced with the RAF did the 110 suddenly become a disaster. Outclassed by the Spitfire and Hurricane, it was soon necessary for 109s to escort the escort fighters. However, later in the war, it proved highly effective as a night fighter. A derivation of the ME-110, the 210, proved a failure for Messerschmitt. However, a new version, the ME-410, proved more successful and served as a destroyer and night fighter to the end of the war. One of the most remarkable of Messerschmitt's wartime aircraft was the giant glider, the ME-321. Following the success of airborne forces in 1940, the German High Command ordered the development of a large transport aircraft capable of invading Britain. Made of steel tubes, wood and fabric, the 321 could carry 33 tons, enabling small tanks and motorized units to be transported. Highly vulnerable and difficult to fly due to its vast control surfaces, the ME321 never proved an effective design. The 323, fitted with four and later six engines, did go into production, but many were lost in combat. Another large project was the ME-264. Capable of bombing the USA, it could have proved a serious threat to the Allies, but only one prototype had flown by 1945. 
In the later stages of the war, German industry used all kinds of forced labor, including concentration camp victims. Many thousands of these people were used in Messerschmitt's plant. Although not directly ordered by Messerschmitt, he was certainly aware of their suffering. Messerschmitt's link with the Nazis had always been close. He owed his very existence to the vast aircraft orders placed by the German military. Hitler himself became a regular visitor to Messerschmitt's plants. Claude Dornier's connection with the Nazis was more ambiguous. The Dornier company had not been so dependent on military aircraft orders, and his personal attitude to the Nazis is not recorded. Apart from the continuing success of his flying boats, Dornier produced only one production aircraft series based on the Do 17. Unlike other German aircraft at the time, the Do 17 was originally intended as passenger transport, but Lufthansa rejected the machine because of its cramped cabin. However, its high speed and maneuverability made it an excellent military aircraft. The Luftwaffe placed large orders, and mass production began in 1937. Despite its success in the early months of the war, the Do 17 soon proved inadequately armed, and Dornier produced an improved version, the Do 215, with a larger cockpit for greater visibility and a position for a rear-facing gun under the nose. Dornier's pioneering spirit was also to produce one of the most advanced fighters to fly in the war. The Do 335 was conceived to meet the demands for a high-speed, high-altitude interceptor. Dornier went back to a patent of 1937 for a unique twin-engined arrangement, one pulling from the nose and one pushing from the tail. In 1939, extensive trials with models began, largely to determine the effect of engine weight in the tail. Because of the rear prop, a tricycle undercarriage was essential. The first test flight took place in 1941, with Dornier anxious to see the results of this radical new design. After initial trials, the aircraft reached a speed of nearly 480 miles per hour, faster than any other prop aircraft of the war. Full production was ordered, although of the 60 that were completed, only 20 reached combat units by 1945. But this was not the end of Claude Dornier's involvement with this aircraft. The last surviving example was taken to America in 1946, where it was placed in store. 25 years later, Dornier brought it back to Germany and began its restoration. Despite the difficulty of spares, Dornier's engineers managed to reassemble the aircraft and return it to its original condition. It now stands as the only example of a tandem prop aircraft in the world. The demands of a desperate high command for a cheap, mass-produced, high-performance fighter gave rise to many innovative designs. One of the most remarkable was the ME-163, seen here on an early unpowered test. The ME-163 Comet was conceived by Dr. Alex Lipich, but production and later development was carried out by Messerschmitt. The aircraft was powered by one of the new generation of rocket engines. To reduce weight and drag, the ME-163 had no tail or undercarriage, taking off on a trolley which was later jettisoned and landing on a wooden skid. The first test flight took place in 1941, and after considerable development, it became operational in 1944. But the aircraft had its dangers. The volatile fuel could dissolve the flesh of pilots and ground crew in a matter of seconds. The high speed of over 600 miles an hour made it difficult to control, and its short endurance, less than one hour, limited its effectiveness. In the end, the 163's inherent dangers led to more aircraft being lost in accidents than were destroyed in combat. Despite its drawbacks, 370 comets were produced and proved a serious threat to the Allies. Able to outperform any of their escort fighters, it caused heavy losses amongst US daylight bomber raids. It remains to this day the only mass-produced rocket fighter in the world. But rocket power was soon to be surpassed by a new and rapidly developing power source, the jet engine. Messerschmitt's old rival, Ernst Heichel, had designed and built the first jet aircraft, the HE-178, in 1938. Powered by a Junkers-designed turbojet, 
It had its first test flight on the 24th of August, 1939. As it lifted from the runway for the first time, few people realized that this small aircraft was to change the shape of world aviation. With the HE-178 success, the race was now on to develop the first production fighter. Heinkel, with a significant lead over his rivals, produced the HE-280, seen here undergoing gliding tests. After extensive trials, the first powered flight took place in August 1941. But Heinkel was not alone in the field. Lily Messerschmitt rapidly designed a new twin-engine jet aircraft. It was to prove to be the most effective fighter of the war. Messerschmitt's prototype had its first flight in 1942, and after modification, was chosen in preference to the HE-280, which was soon scrapped. As with the HE-280, the 262 was powered by two Junkers turbojets. Despite their innovative design, they were prone to catch fire and were generally unreliable in the early versions. When the engines did work, the aircraft's performance was impressive. A rate of climb of 12,000 meters a minute and a speed of 470 miles per hour outclassed any Allied fighter. Crippled by fuel shortages and Hitler's insistence that it be used as a bomber, the 262 never lived up to its full potential. It represented both the height and, at the same time, the end of Willy Messerschmitt's career. In 1945, Virtually all of Dornier and Messerschmitt's plants were destroyed. Both men were captured by the Allies and imprisoned for two years. The ban on aircraft production was imposed once again. German aviation lay buried beneath the rubble of its factories. But the reconstruction of this shattered country demanded engineers. And after the release in 1947, both men began to rebuild their companies. Dornier moved to a small factory and started to design and build weaving machines, a subsidiary which has survived to this day. Messerschmitt reopened the Augsburg plant and constructed prefabricated housing. Later, he designed a successful sewing machine, a four-door car, and his famous three-wheeled bubble car. But Messerschmitt wasn't satisfied. Aviation was, of course, always on uh, Willy's mind in those days where he was not permitted to do that in Germany. And in the early 50s, an opportunity was offered to do airplane design in Spain. Spain uh, had been a licensee of uh, Messerschmitt in the early 40s. In fact, the Messerschmitt 109 was built there under license construction and the Spaniards wanted to do modifications of that airplane, including um, putting a British engine, a Rolls-Royce Merlin, in there instead of the uh, daimler Pins engine, which was no longer available. But then the Spaniards also wanted some uh, training airplanes, and uh, uh, Messerschmitt, together with the engineering team of that Spanish company, uh, developed the first uh, Spanish jet aeroplane, a little twin jet trainer. Claude Dornier was also forced to turn to Spain to continue his passion for aviation. In 1950, he established a technical office in Madrid, and with the help of a German and Spanish design team, he produced the DO-25, a short takeoff and landing reconnaissance aircraft. The first test flight in 1954 proved a great success, and the Spanish government, echoing their earlier involvement with the Val aircraft, placed a large order, once again ensuring Dornier's survival. In 1955, with the ban on aviation development lifted, Dornier returned to Munich to build the more advanced DO-27. Investing all his resources to begin production, Dornier counted heavily on winning a contract from the recently reformed Luftwaffe for a light trainer. After extensive evaluation of the aircraft, the DO-27 became the first German aircraft to be mass-produced since 1945. Ten years after its total destruction, Germany's aviation industry had been reborn. 
A larger addition to the Storrow family, the Doe 28, was launched in 1960 and proved as successful as its predecessor. Dornier, still the prime mover in the design program, celebrated his 70th birthday as Germany's leading aviation designer. Ten years later, the last development of the Stoll family took to the air, the Sky Servant. Larger than its predecessor, it soon proved a vital element in many Third World relief operations. The German armed forces also brought large numbers of the Sky Servant, which became their main transport aircraft. With the threat of a surprise attack from the east, the Luftwaffe asked for a whole range of quick response aircraft. Dornier soon began work on a vertical takeoff and landing design. Referring back to a patent he originally made in 1924, he developed a small piston-engined extreme short takeoff and landing aircraft, designated the Doe 29. Encouraged by the success of the Doe 29, Dornier was keen to move on to a larger project. In 1962, the development of the Doe 31, a large vertical takeoff and landing transport aircraft, was given the go-ahead. Two years later, watched by Dornier and his wife, the test rig takes to the skies. Some 200 successful test flights were made, and Dornier, although then in his 80s, vigorously pursued the development of a prototype. In 1967, the world's first and only Vertol jet transport takes to the air. In nearly 500 flights, the validity of Dornier's Vertol concept is completely proven. Although the Doe 31 never found a commercial market, it re-established German aviation's lead in technical innovation. While Dornier enjoyed success, Willy Messerschmitt struggled for survival. Despite a series of highly advanced designs, such as the X-1, a prototype Vertol fighter, developed in 1962, his company survived only by building aircraft like the Douglas Harvard under small license contracts with the USA. But things were soon to change. Uh, then came uh, larger license uh, manufacturing programs. Uh, the biggest one was the uh, Lockheed Starfighter uh, program, American uh, license, and uh, that really helped to rebuild the uh, company in a fairly big uh, scale, considering uh, the uh, post-war uh, situation. Messerschmitt's production soon began to expand. In 1955, he took over the Heinkel Company, writing the last chapter in their long battle. Other acquisitions followed, beginning a highly significant trend in European aviation. I think that was the start of the big wave of subsequent mergers which took uh, place simply because the uh, number of projects which could be uh, offered and which were available in the aviation business uh, reduced. The designs were uh, more far-reaching, while in the old days, about every year or two, a new design was done. Uh, now a design uh, uh, was lasting for 10 or even 20 years. MBB, Messerschmitt Böko Blom, was formed uh, in uh, 1969 to 1970 on that account. MBB has now become the largest aircraft manufacturer in Germany. Cooperation has also become international. The Transol C-160, a large transport aircraft, is made in cooperation with Aerospatial. MBB has the major stake in the design work and constructs the whole of the fuselage. They also produce a helicopter, the BO-105, designed and produced exclusively in Germany and sold in both civil and military variants. In 1970, having seen his company rebuilt from nothing, Willy Messerschmitt felt able to retire. Claude Donnier never retired staying with his company until his death in 1969. His spirit as a manager of people and designer of aircraft had molded his company for 60 years. The Dornier Company survives today as the last independent aircraft manufacturer in Germany and remains at the forefront of aircraft design. The Alpha Jet, an advanced trainer and light bomber, is currently being flown by the German, French and Belgian armed forces. 
In the late 60s, NATO recognized the need to standardize its various aircraft types. MBB realized that European cooperation could challenge the USA's aircraft producers. That idea came to fruition with the Panavia Consortium, combining Germany, Italy, and the UK. This cooperative effort was to produce one of the most advanced aircraft of modern times, the Tornado. Given its first test flight in 1974, the Tornado brought together all the best elements of previous attack aircraft. The Tornado's most recognizable feature is its variable wing configuration, allowing for both supersonic flight and high maneuverability at low speeds. In 1980, the Tornado became the frontline strike aircraft of the British, Italian and German Air Forces, beating off competition from the USA's F-16. German aircraft expertise, combined with European cooperation, had won the day. As well as large stakes in the design, MBB build the central fuselage segment and assemble all tornadoes destined for the German armed forces. They also have a major stake in the Airbus program, being partners with Aerospatial and British Aerospace in the consortium of Airbus Industries. Inspired by the tornado's success, Airbus was conceived as a challenge to the USA's domination in the field of passenger aircraft. Development began in the 1970s with the A300, a mid-range wide-bodied aircraft. Test flights proved successful and large orders were placed. Construction of the Airbus takes place all over Europe, with MBB building fuselage sections in Hamburg, and Dornier, the rear fuselage sections, control surfaces and bulkheads in Munich. Components for the Airbus are then transported by Super Guppy, a converted strata cruiser, to Toulouse for final assembly. Success of the A300 has produced a whole family of Airbus jets, including the larger A310 and the highly advanced fly-by-wire A320, using electronics rather than hydraulics. The 320 leads a range of aircraft already used by over 80 airlines. German aviation is challenging the United States in a new, dangerous but rewarding field, space. In the space area, European collaboration also started in the uh, 60s. And the uh, most significant element is, of course, the autonomous launching capability through uh, Ariane and uh, it's quite significant that Ariane has developed into a commercial venture also not just a government-run venture through the Ariane Spass uh, company in which uh, MBB is also a partner among many other European uh, uh, companies. Germany also contributes a large part to the Columbus project, a highly advanced space laboratory that will be part of the USA's space station. Going into operation at the turn of the century, it will collect all kinds of information to help man's understanding and future exploration of space. Europe has always lagged behind in the field of manned spaceflight, but this is about to change. The Hermes space module, 
launched on an Ariane 5 rocket, will take the first European astronaut into space. Future projects such as Zengar will revolutionize high-speed passenger transport and will reduce the flight time from London to Sydney to just 45 minutes. Throughout the destruction that had marked the darker side of German aviation, the desire to fly endured. The dream had been fulfilled.